everyone and welcome to today's health promotion live webinar this is Kelly House sitting in for Mike LaConnelly today we have Dr. D. Eddington Dr. Eddington is a professor of kinesiology and the director of health management research center at University of Michigan so go ahead and take it away D. okay well thanks Kelly well hello everyone or no one looks to me like a good screen here so I'm going to just start right in. Uh, that's our house. That's where I am right now. And that corner that's closest to you uh, is, um, I don't know if you can see that uh, arrow, let me use the arrow. Uh, that's where my office is, and I'm right there behind that air conditioner. But it's, uh, it's not sunny today. It's, uh, we have two inches of snow. So today I'm going to talk about what we've been doing for the last 30 years. And uh, well, actually, actually since 1977. And, uh, uh, and tell you what I think we we've, we've done wrong, and I tell you where where I think we're going, and uh, and we're gonna look at uh, essentially I'm looking for what are the, what are the next practices, not best practices, but next practices. So that's where I'm going to end up. But first, I'm going to review quickly where we have been. So let me ask all of you a question, and you can now obviously I can't they give it your response, but uh, I'll tell you the response I'm getting. If you work for the best possible company you can imagine, a company high performing, doing everything just right, and you have the best uh, set of colleagues, and, you're, and if you're the owner, or just work around, look around and say, uh, well, how would you describe your workplace and especially the workforce? What would they, what would they be like if you just use simple uh, descriptions? And I've asked this uh, a couple of the last couple of weeks on that. Uh, two CEO groups I was working with, uh, CFO group, and then uh, yesterday, early this week, election in Kentucky, and and yesterday in Hammond, Indiana, in the Dallas, Texas, and Decatur, Illinois, in the last couple of weeks, just and uh, several others. But I asked people, and they they start to give me answer. They say, well, they're energetic, they're creative, they have optimism, they're resilient, high levels of vitality, and that they. Smile. They're having, you know, they feel like that's really part of, part of them. And I said that's perfect because every everyone says the same thing. That's a high. So that's the high level, the high level objectives of what we do. So keep that in mind as I go through this uh, talk. Not once in any of those, and I've done some one in Philadelphia, and in San Francisco and San, San Diego. Not once in any of those questions like this. Did anyone ever mention body weight, exercise, blood pressure? Never. Not, not any of them have mentioned that. So that should give you a clue of where I'm going with, uh, with our work. The business problem that most people have is that all of these, all of these costs are unsustainable. And you all know that. Everyone knows that. that uh, whether it's medical or pharmacy or short-term disability, long-term disability, workers' comp or presenteeism, it's all sustainable. So the question is, how are we going to be successful increasing the competitive world without a healthy and high-performing workplace? And that's really critical because most organizations don't even know where the competition is going to come from in the next five to ten years. Like utilities at one time, thought it was everyone, you got to have coal or electricity or nuclear here in this country to make electricity. Now we can buy it from Brazil or China or wherever. So there's really a, a Another way to think about where we're going. And the issue is, how do you turn those costs into an investment? Once you get to that, now you got the company uh, hooked because investments are a good thing for them. So these are the companies that we've worked with these uh, several yeah, years and, and uh, a variety of, of companies. But you notice they're pretty big companies. And I chose uh, businesses uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because that's where the money is. And just like bank robbers chose banks in the 1920s, that's where the money is. There's no way else in America has any money other than in businesses. And no one else in America ever benefits from healthy and high-performing people, only, only companies and people themselves. 
So I see a lot of people in the media that I had, a lot of people benefit from sickness. Uh, and that's the ones you think about when you think about health care. But the people that benefit from health are these companies. And they're big companies because that's where the data are. And I don't believe in individual risk factors, individual diseases. I believe in combinations of disease and, uh, and uh, combinations of risk factors. So you got to work with big companies, get the data. Now we're trying to apply it to small, medium-sized companies because in America that's where most of the people are. So today I'm going to talk about the natural flow, first of all, uh, high risk and high cost. What happens if you don't do anything to people? Business case, serious business economic strategy. And a lot of you heard me talk. I want to do the same uh, talk with a much different twist now. The mission. Now the mission is to change from the economic assumptions. We've got to change the economic assumptions from treating disease, the tired old assumptions of disease in the 20th, 20th century. We have to change our assumptions to the 21st century assumptions of what's the, what's the assumptions about creating and maintaining healthy populations. It's a whole different way to look at a population. But then running to you know, running from disease, but how how are we going to run towards healthy populations? It's a major switch in uh, in our thinking here. And then the solution that I propose in the in Zero Trends book as well, somewhat Zero Trends book, but it's gone beyond that now. It has to be systematic. You have to have a framework for what you're doing. It has to be systemic. You have to get into the core of the company or the culture and environment. It has to be sustainable. It has to be spread out over time. It can't just be one for 12 week or a year or two years, but it has to long, go long term. So that's what we're going to talk about and I'm going to talk about today. So the next first section is about natural flow. Wait for disease and then treat. That's what America does. And in fact, everyone in the world does this. This whole problem we're talking about here is a worldwide problem. It's just not America. It's a US problem. It's a worldwide problem. But the natural flow is wait for disease and then treat. But I, I believe more, and I follow a lot of Deming's work and uh, Drucker's work, and the work that they had. Ken Blanchard's still alive talking about leadership. These are the kind of thoughts that I use in the systemic and small wins kind of thinking. But in quality terms, and that's where those people led me to, quality terms, that means we wait for defects and then fix defects. And that's what medicine does in general. Not all, not all diseases are... are uh, you know, called defects, and, uh, but some of them are. There are a great many of them, maybe 50, 60 percent of them. Just wait for defects and then fix them. And wellness also just waits for defects. People get overweight, not exercising, drink too much, smoke too much, and so forth. So I think neither medicine nor wellness are, will ever take America to a healthy and high-performing country. It's impossible. And just be just wait for defects. Well, here are the risk factors that we've been measuring, and uh, everyone, often many people will measure this, they do health risk appraisals. We've done 6 million health risk appraisals now, and measuring these kind of things, now we can estimate any uh, population if we know their age and gender. And so that's, this is a typical working population. 14% of the population have no those risks. So that's important. But the interesting thing to me in, a, in our analytics is the low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And, a lot of people use these, uh, this uh, stratification that we, we published in early 1991 from Steelcase, and it will work out from there. We've used that for every all of our data since then. And 64% of the population almost always, it, it varies. I mean, it better be 64%, it could be 45%, it could be 68%. And low risk in, in year one. And that's good, and 11% high risk. And on the left-hand side, you see medium risk, you see 24% medium risk. And then if you look at year two, uh, year two, three, three years, 64% uh, of the population uh, is, uh, is low risk. 61, 64 in one, year one, 64, 61 three years later. And high risk went from 10, 11% to 12%. So that's sort of useless data because you don't know where the people went. But we do in our in our um, analytics and our longitudinal database. Uh, we look at where where did the people go, and so 78% of the population stayed low risk over over a three-year period, and those are the champions. And then I ask Americans, what do we do for those people? 
What do we do for low risk and those who stay low risk? And every every crowd gets the same thing. They understand nothing. America does nothing for those people, as the rest of the world does nothing. And so I ask business people, where, where else in business do you do nothing for your champions, except in healthcare? Well, we'll come back to that a lot, a lot uh, throughout this next 45 minutes. So some people got better, and some people got worse. So that's a natural flow. Everyone, everyone in this audience and on this call. And everyone in Michigan, everyone in the United States, everyone in the world is on one of those places. You start out one of the boxes and with the rectangles, and then you go to one of the line, one of the you have three choices on your lines. You either stay where you are, get worse, or, or get better. So I ask you, if that, here's the goal, here the goal is to get to 75% in this bar this rectangle, 75% of the population, total population, not just HRA participants. But that means then you got to get everyone involved. you got to get the whole uh, company involved, the whole population, whether it's a company or whether it's a community or whatever. 75% have to stay there, have to be there, and 85% have to stay there over time if you're going to get to zero trends. And I won't show you the rest of the data, but then we take the same population here and put it and put and apply their costs, and those same people that are low risk are often, most often, low cost. And then the costs they have the same kind of metrics. So those are your metrics. That's the goal of a of a wellness and workplace or wellness and community. Seventy five percent low risk, eighty five percent of the population stays low risk over time. Of that, if you don't can't get to that, then the other fire you can get somebody that can do it. Because we, we can't we can't tolerate anyone not doing that anymore. Here's another natural flow. We get this from our database. This is 12 years, a six-year, I'm sorry, six-year history of, of a population. The red line, if we get $5,000 or more in a medical in one quarter, we put, I call that quarter zero. We go back uh, six, 12 quarters and forward 12 quarters. That's a natural flow of a heart attack or a serious medical problem. Yellow line is, is 500 to 5,000. Green line is not even 500. So I ask people, well, well, where do you want to be? Which which bar do you want to be on? Yellow, or red, yellow, or green? And eventually, most people say green. And I said, that's good. Second question: uh, Who's the leader that's going to get you there and keep you there? And it probably it takes a while for people to figure that out. But they they end up not saying doctor. They all end up saying, I'm my own self leader. That's good. Third question: Are you interested or committed to get on that green bar and say that green line and say that? Everybody gets it. If you, want, if you say those questions, you want to be a green line, I'm my own self-leader, and I'm committed, we're done. So whatever, there's 150 people on this call, that's all we have to do. Get everyone to commit to that and, and uh, go on. And your company, get everyone in your company or everyone in your community. 80-20 rule is always true, but it's useless rule in this because uh, it's, by the time you analyze it, you identify the 20 people, they're already down on the bottom, you know, down slope of the curve. And there's another group up there. So you can't do anything with it. So it's true. Every year you can claim it's true, but you can't do anything. You can't make any strategy out of it. The only strategy is to get people you know, up way back here in minus quarter 12 and start helping them stay down and maybe move to the yellow or green or stay on the yellow or green. All right, here's another, uh, now this is the last natural flaw. Here's a group of uh, people, and these are the costs are on the left-hand side. These are, we go back to our original uh, data. This was steel case data in 1991. But every every population looks the same. By age group, pick your age group, if you use the one you're at. And these are low-risk people, and then here's the medium-risk people. Here's the medium, yeah, but, and not, those are the white ones are the non-participants. We don't know any risk factors, but we know their costs. People in yellow are the, the medium risk people, and the red are the high risk people. So I asked you the same three irritating questions. Which bar do you want to be on? And now, of course, it's blue. And that's why we work in Michigan. And by the way, those, and that M up there in the left hand corner, that's, that's my slide. So you know, if you don't like that, I'll well, get your own slides. Uh, the yellow is three to four risk factors, and the red are five or more. And so, you know, which, which bar do you want to be on? Who's the leader going to get me and keep me there? And are you interested or committed? So those are the three things that 
that happen. But America is following that red line. Just the Marco of China I just showed you a little while ago. Americans get older, as, as everyone in the world does, and they increase in risk as you get older. That's just the way the American life is. And actually, in the most developed countries, that's the way it is. So we go to section two. That was a do-nothing strategy, by the way. It took us 10 years to do that. And we know that America is not going to be very successful following that do-nothing strategy. Unfortunately, that's the way America has been doing. Business has been doing that for, for 60 years since they took over the health of uh, their employees after World War II. So we push, then we did publish 200 publications going forward after that uh, to look at the total value of health and how do you get to the uh, total population and get the total value of health. I won't go through that in the documents. that later. Uh, excess risk, uh, first of all, we had to say our risk related to disease. And that's sort of trivial now, but that's the way we get tenure at the universities. Is take complicated things to make them trivial. And we get tenure, and you pay for us the rest of our lives. All right, so here's the five risk factors. If you're low risk, uh, five diseases, heart, diabetes, cancer, bronchitis, emphysema. If you're low risk and less than 45, 3% of your cohort are going to have one of those five diseases. If you're greater than 65, 18%. And if you're low risk and greater than 65, 18% will have that disease. Here's a medium risk and high risk people. High risk people, if you're greater than 65, 80% will have one of those diseases. If you're less than 45, 25%. So there's a clear relationship between risk factors and disease. Next is the excess costs. Here, the low risk people, zero two risk. In this population, again, steel case in this original work, $2,100 per year for medical and pharmacy. High-risk people, $5,500 per year. The numbers in white are the excess costs due to excess risk. Take the $5,500 and minus $2,100, you get $3,300. So those excess costs because you have excess risk. And that now participants, they're a mixture of all low-risk, medium-risk, and high-risk. Um, but Obviously, they're, they're a little towards the high-risk people because they're much more than the low-risk people. So $840 excess cost there. Then in the steel case, we look at it short-term disability. 41% of excess costs are due to uh, all, those excess, all those costs are due to excess risk. 24% of workers comp, 29% absent, 38% of medical pharmacy. 36% of all those costs are due to excess risk. So risk are really driving disease, and now we show they're driving costs. Then the question came out, well, that's interesting. But what if they change costs? Will they change disease? So we've done several papers on that over a couple of years. And this is simplistic. By the way, I try to make my slides as simplistic as possible. Now, simplicity is an interesting concept, because simplicity before you get to complexity is sort of useless. But once you work through it and get to the complexity out, and then you can make it simple, then you can get people to understand it and, and intuitively correct. So here, risk increase, cost increase, risk decrease, cost reduce. However, notice that when risk increase, the costs go up much quicker than they come down. That's a key key fact. And now at the bottom, I got some made some changes. I should have the lines got a little out of out of uh, sync, but the risk goes. Up, costs go up quicker than when risk go down and costs go down. So it, it starts to make sense that maybe we ought to think more about preventing risk increase rather than trying to reduce risk. In this slide, turn our our thinking around quite a bit because then you know, we we actually had the data probably 10 years or 15 years before we saw this slide. It happened to be one of our one of our analysts here is that well. What happens if people don't get worse? What if they just don't get worse or get better? The green line, the green line shows you if they don't get worse or get better, they get to zero trends over over CPI over three years. The ones in yellow got worse, and we get statistically significant just in those two two uh, three years. The ones that that um, 
didn't get worse or you improved, the $117 a year average, and the ones that did that did uh, got worse, $614 a year average increase. So that was a really interesting concept, and it really uh, uh, really pushed me on the writing the zero trends. The major issue out of the talks I give now is for America, just don't get worse. Just stop getting worse. Or also, we help the healthy people stay healthy. So those are the two premises that we take forward going forward. So here's the economics. Here's what companies are looking at. The total value of health, we said before, there's an unsustainable medical, pharmacy, drugs, all those things that we, we spent our, all those years looking at. These are the outcome measures. So companies are looking at that and they say, gee, what's driving those costs? So then you, you bring it, they bring in some benefit consultant and they'll say, well, that's an interesting question. And then I go back and run some numbers, and two weeks later they come back and give me the answer to disease. Well, the company asked a trivial question, and the benefit director gave them a trivial answer, but in the meantime collected ten ten to hundred thousand dollars for the, the issue. So that's the way companies and organizations have been doing business for sixty years. Just pain. Just pain. That's why we have such big hospitals and big insurance companies and so forth. And it's it's really upsetting to me when I go into town to see see cities, and the biggest employer in that city is a hospital or the insurance company. Put them all together, and you got the biggest buildings. And then I say, well, that's that's really too bad when hospitals and and uh, doctors and nurses and insurance companies are the biggest single industry sector because that means we're we're just we're just taking care of sick people. And that's that's not good for America. If we're gonna go forward with a healthy and high performing country, it's gonna to have to be something more than that. But that in the business case I just showed you that health risk are really disease and some health risks actually drive costs by themselves. So now health promotion people are happy because now they can make some money. Make some money off of you know reducing weight, exercising, exercise, or reducing smoking, and so forth. So they, now they're making money now. They're happy, but I'm not very happy yet because where do these high risk people come from? Well, they come from the low risk population. So it seems to me like where where does cost earned investment? Well, this is cost on the disease side. That's an investment on the low risk side. So any company knows you want to go far upstream as you can and to solve your problems. But we don't do that in health care. We, we just wait for, um, let that go. We wait for uh, risk factors to happen, then we wait for disease to happen, then we pay for them. Well, this is, the, this is the model that we use, our framework since 1981, and we've modified it a few times since then. But health manager, or wellness program, change lifestyle, healthier people, better employers, gains the organization. And those are the 200 publications that we had all related to those art combinations. All right, well, that's what we did up until uh, 2006. December 2006, we celebrated our 30 years of work. We thought we were pretty good, so we congratulated ourselves on really good. Uh, but then we woke up the next morning and said nothing's changed in the population. 60 years of medicine. 30 years of wellness, and nothing's changed. No more people are doing physical activity than 30 years ago. You know, change the faces, but that's about all. No fewer people are weighing less. Obesity is not going down, the number of people with obesity. And no fewer people have diabetes. In fact, all these things are going the opposite direction. So where's the disconnect? There has to be a disconnect between the business case and what's the intervention, what's the outcome in the real world. So that was really uh, confusing uh, to me. So we had to go to my friend Albert, and I said, "Albert, you need some help here. What's the difference? What's the problem with it? What the business case says, and what the outcomes in?" Well, Albert, you know, as everyone knows, Albert Einstein, and I'm looking forward to meeting him someday, but no hurry if you do that. But Albert would say the level of thinking that got you into this is not the same level of thinking that's going to get you out of it. In other words, more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals are not going to get us out of this 
situation. More wellness people are not going to get us out of this situation. Kelly would say if you're doing the same thing over and over again, you're still getting the same results, you're the same. You know, somebody's right there. So if that's all true, where do we go next? So what's the next level? Well, we've got to find a new level of thinking. And I think a new level of thing is a transformation from the tired old assumptions of the 20th century about disease to new, brand new 21st centuries about healthy and high performing populations. We've got to stop and rethink what we've been doing. We've got to go from health as the absence of disease to disease as the absence of health to sort of turn that around rather than focus on absence of disease. Let's focus on the absence of health. That's the problem. So we've got to work towards health. From the cost of disease to the total investment in value disease, that means not just medical and pharmacy, but you've got to end in the productivity things yet and the quality of life issues. From individual participation to total population, this is about individual participation. But if you can't talk about 14 people change their body weight. You've got to talk about what the population did. Is the population really making a difference? And from behavior change to integration of health into the culture. By the way, I think uh, behavior change is probably another failed strategy uh, because everyone knows if you take a changed person, put them back in the same environment, they go right back. So we sort of set that process up for failure. So section three is where I'm now getting to next practices. Integrate health in the environment and culture. Now, that mean and Drucker and Blanchard are starting to get happy. And I am too, because now we fix the systems that leave the defects. But that's not new. I'm just asking America to consider what safety did in the 1920s and 30s. They cleaned up the slippery floors, the toxic fumes. They really got people to say, what is it that leads to those accidents? They're still working on it. They haven't got it right yet either. But the workplace has changed somewhat. Too. So they fixed the system that led to the defects. And then I look at of quality. What do American managers do, and leaders, and, and unions, and, and manufacturing, uh, leaders, and uh, unions, and uh, companies? What, what do they do? They fix the systems that led to the defects. So instead of recalling the cars, we fix the cars better going out. You fix the systems that led to those defects. So that's what I'm asking us to do as, as well. I'm part, of the, I'm part of the problem as well. We've got to fix the systems that lead to, led to those defects. That's why I wrote Zero Trends. The transformational approach, and at that time it was 175 publications. It's not a wellness program, it's a transformational approach about business and serious economic strategy. In yeah. health and culture, remember this, this is where we started, and the, the, the thing we, we did wrong uh, over those years was that we looked at, we looked at people who changed risk factors. We made the major assumption, which was incorrect, we made the major assumption that people change risk factors because they were in wellness programs or got help from behavior change. And I think that was wrong because I think that was the spontaneous uh, change rate we were looking at, not the actual uh, change rate. Now, because the actual change rate wasn't any better than the spontaneous change rate. So the, the solution is here. How do we create the company culture and environment with five pillars? Senior leadership, the CEO, the board, senior leadership, CEO, CFO, and so forth. Operations leadership that often falls to senior uh, human resource person. Self-leadership, everyone has to assume their own self-leadership. Reward positive actions. I never give smokers $100 to quit smoking. <laughs> Don't do that. Give, it, give the non-smokers $100 and let the smokers figure it out themselves. Quality assurance. And quality assurance I use in a, in a sense of not evaluation or measurement, but quality. How do you maintain quality in your organization? Characteristics of a champion company, pretty simple, three S's. Systematic. It has to be a systematic, it has to have a framework. And the framework that I put there are those five pillars. And in the, in the, in the process of getting those systematic, you make it systemic. It becomes part of the culture. And then finally, it has to be sustainable. So those are the three th things that I think our goals are. And you already told me what you think the goals of the people are should be. What would you like them to look like? So we'll get to that in a few minutes, too. But the program has to be systematic, systemic, and sustainable. So first of all, senior leadership. 
senior leaders have to create the vision. You know, what's the vision? Senior leaders have that responsibility. They have the responsibility to set the purpose of the organization, the values, the mission, the vision, and everyone has to it has to come from the bottom up as well. And the senior leadership is not in management, but it's in union as well. That's why I call it leadership, not management. The leadership in in organization and the organizations include management and unions. It has to be committed to a healthy culture, connect the vision, strategy, engage all leadership in the vision. Everybody has to be involved. Every senior leader has to be drinking the same Kool-Aid and talking the same way. Is that you gotta establish the value what is the value of a healthy and high performing company? And then I and now we're trying to do more work with communities now as well. I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But we get the same way in the communities. What's the value of a healthy and high performing economic value of a healthy and high performing workforce in the community? Would more companies come there and fewer leave? And your home as well. What's the value of a healthy and high performing people? You have a happier family? That's a tough one to answer. I don't know about that one yet. Create the vision. I like this first part up here. Link the company, uh, link the uh, vision to the mission. Our mission as a company, and if it's a public company, it'd be a little different, but it'd still be a mission. Our mission is to create shareholder value. And it could be in a public company, you say our mission is to create a high quality of life of living in this community. We get value from creating innovative products. So they understand managers, everyone that goes to MBA schools understands that link of creative and innovative products to shareholder value. They get that link. They don't get the next link. We get products from healthy and high, high productive uh, people. MBA programs, as far as I can see, and I've taught in, in uh, several, I've been talking to executive education programs here at Michigan for 22 years. Yeah, they don't get that link between people and product, and, and they get the product to value, but they don't get the people to product you know, as, as good as they should. And they talk about it, and they understand that, but they don't, they don't operate like that. Then they create the, create the vision. It has to be connected to the, to the strategy. So those are the things that, that senior leaders have to think about. And then I asked at the, in my consulting with a company, we started a private company to do this because here at, the, at Michigan we have great 34 or 38 people, but they're really good at analytics and on measurement of uh, benefit cost ratios. We don't do much of that, but slope measures, Markov chains. We look at the relationship for risk and cost. We're very good at that. We got very good people, but they're not the same people who go out and, and do it in the in the uh, so-called real world, I guess, and organizational world. The vision is the overriding principle. That vision is so critical that everybody understands that vision. It's so critical to the operations. It's based on your values and your your purpose. And when companies lose that vision. They get in trouble, just like BP did in the in the golf uh, last year. They just lost the value of safety, and they lost the value of principles of, of really believing what we do. And when you substitute, when you're in business for, to make money, that's not a good reason to be in business. Operations leadership align the workplace with a vision, so that the senior leaders can't do this. They're just part of the overhead, and when they just go out and I don't know what they do. They, they talk and they eat chicken dinners and play golf and know what they do. But they, they clearly have to be the vision. They have to understand the vision. They have to make that very clear, what we're doing. They have to brand things. So this is the, the HR people now. They have to align, they have to create that culture and environment that allow that vision to come alive. It's a workplace. So in the workplace, not necessarily in the workforce yet. First of all, they have to work in the workplace, and that's where I think wellness has missed it uh, to a great extent because we focus on the workforce all this time. I, I ask people, well, what's your engagement level? And they, almost everyone will go to how many people are participating. <laughs> well, that's sort of a wasted effort to do that. You got First of all, you got to go beyond participation one, but more so, I think that when I say what's the engagement level, I would like, what's the engagement level of your senior leaders? It, what's the engagement level of the company? That's the most important engagement to think about. And then you go to the people in the workplace. So it has to be branded. Everyone has to know your brand. You have to have a brand. 
so I think it's recognizable. Anyway, all policies, all policies have to be aligned. You got to engage everyone because of this fact right here. That was so critical. That's why I said behavior change doesn't work. But if we do, if we do our culture and our environment correctly, and create a supportive environment, supportive culture, now behavior change will work. I believe in behavior change, but not without a supportive environment to back it up. But I don't. I hate to see these 12 week weight loss programs or these 15 week exercise programs. Everybody does that, right? I mean, that's, that's a simple one. I want to see three year outcomes. I think publishing, publishing, no manuscripts should be published unless they have three year, one or three year outcome measures. You know, we, we know all that, well, that short term tough. The issue is who can make it, who can make it sustainable? I, you know, if you get a 50 year study, that's even better, but nobody's going to do that. I remember this graph I showed you. Here's the benefit plan. This is why the benefit plan I think is important and critical. The benefit plan, we've always done this to taking care of the sick people and they're right in the middle. But to go forward, we have to reduce errors and we have to coordinate services. And if we don't re reduce errors in some of these hospitals and coordinate services in, some, in the medical system all together, nursing system, then we have to put them on business. Well, first of all, we've got to help them get better. And business can be very good about helping hospitals and doctors and so forth get better at what they do. You have techniques. You have business have techniques to do that. But if they don't get better, then we put them on business, and then we we uh, turn all those hospitals into low rent condos for seniors. I mean, those those places are pretty good. They got some bathrooms right next to where they sleep and so forth. And it's a good place. So that's one part. That's the one part. But that's up until 15 years ago. That's all medicine, all insurance companies did was pay for pay for this. But now uh, we need, as part of the benefit plan, you need to take care of people over here. On the right-hand side, if they have the disease, they can still be uh, highly productive. They won't be low cost again if they stay on the protocol. But they can be very productive. But we have to help them stay on protocol. And disease management, really what they do is have you not get worse. Just don't get that spike over on the right-hand side. And the third part of a good benefit plan, in my opinion, is the health management or wellness side over the left-hand side. In fact, I think that's where the return on investment is. How do you help the healthy people stay healthy, and how do you help them not get worse? So that, to me, that's a perfect benefit plan. And then you have to have, you have, to have the children involved, too. How, how do you get your dependents involved? So this has to be the whole population, not just the employee population, but the, the uh, uh, family as well. So where's the economic strategy? Well, my biased opinion is over on the left-hand side. Of course, the economic strategy is every place. So we got, and also in the operations, we integrate all the outsourced partners. Our vendors, we kill all the vendors. No vendors, because vendors just bring you bring you thoughts and bring you not thoughts, bring you product, and then try to force the product into your system. Now the partner will come with with the thoughts and and products. But they make it fit in your system. They help you. They work with you. They fit in. If it doesn't fit, they'll find something else. They won't try to sell you something that won't work. You get all the internal. Everyone in the internal has to be saying the same thing. If you got short-term uh, disability being managed by one group and workers' comp being managed by another group, if they're not aligned, you, know, you may be hurting each other. Coordinate all the resources towards a healthy and high-performing environment culture. And follow the safety and quality strategies that we talked about before. So everything has to be aligned. That's a big job, especially some big companies. Small companies. See, this is a better deal for small companies than for large companies. Small companies can do this quicker and cheaper and better than large companies because they can get to everyone, and they have a lot of community resources that you use. They don't try to do it all themselves. Now you, now you go to the people. Finally, now you go to the people, self-leadership. And the idea of self-leadership is create winners. How do we help people be a winner? What's a winner? Well, I know one thing. Uh, people are not creating winners when you put up the pedometers out there and say you have to walk 10,000 steps. You put up weight loss up there. You have to be BMI 25. Put cholesterol and blood pressure out there, and you've got to get control of those. Those, there's not one of you on this phone call, not one of you any any seminar I've been into will say 
that we can get everyone in our organization to do those things six, for six months. So essentially, what we've done in the wellness, and led by CDC of all things, uh, we've created losers. We're losers and failures. So I say let's create winners. So on your pedometer, let's walk 500 or 1,000 steps and body weight, let's don't gain weight. And blood pressure and cholesterol, let's just know your blood pressure and cholesterol. Now we create winners. Now we've got winners. Now we can go, what about the next six months? Well, public health people say, well, you said the bar too low. I said, well, maybe. Well, tell me what you've done in the last 30 years. You know, we don't have any fewer with people with diabetes, nobody with body weight and so forth. So we've got to create winners before you start to you know, get to be creating winners. But that's over three, four, six-month periods. Help people not get worse, help healthy people stay healthy, provide improvement maintenance. We've got to provide all those strategies, all the weight loss and exercise, but those are all important strategies. But they're not the only strategy. They only have tools to get to the overall strategy of creating winners. So the, the difference between strategies and tools is you're creating winners, and then tools are what you use to create the winners. So create winners one step at a time. The first step is don't get worse. And by the way, you can't, you can't get better until you stop getting worse, and it's impossible. You can't go from worse to better without not getting worse. All right, self-leadership. Now, remember those, the, the first slide I showed you? I asked people, you know, what describe a person that's in a healthy, high-performing, high-productive, profitable, meeting all their mission statements, what would that person look like? Here's some words that you used. Uh, I've heard optimism, personal control, resilient, the left-hand side, confidence, self-efficacy, self-esteem, vitality. So those are some things that we want to create. And what we're doing now, we've, we've got a, a type of videos, and, and everyone has to, not videos, but uh, on the web, you can go in and pass the six tests. And some of them will be around uh, optimism, some will be around resilience, some will be around consumerism. And a brief one is right, right on, what's, the, what's change like? How do you change anything? Because it's still about low risk, and we're still looking at low risk data, so you still have to get there. But I think people ought to know their purpose in life, vision, values, mission, vision. So it's a little hard, but that's, that's a serious business strategy. But it has to be connected into that environment and culture up in the left-hand corner, that supportive environment and culture. It has to be over here connected to consumerism, we have to teach people about consumerism. What's it like to, to buy the right things? Where, where, how do you shop around to find the right place to go for any problems you have, whether it's food or whether it's a replaced left arm? Social support, hugely important. Family, friends, coworkers, supervisors. How do you, how do you teach people to utilize their communities, to utilize their faith groups, to utilize their coworkers? Not in a negative way, but use them as, as social support for each other. Knowledge, how, what kind of knowledge do they need? Most people like, have a lot of knowledge now, they just don't know how to use it necessarily. Health literacy and negotiation skills. Now, if you don't like any of those words, well, look at the bottom ones. You know, five lines, change, vision, trust, thrive, enthusiasm, ethics, energy, spirituality, creativity. Make up your own words. What do you think you know, people, you want the people look like in a healthy and high-performing company? That's your goal. That's the goal. That's a high-level high goal. Now, you're still going to need all these things, population-based research. You still need all those things, weight management, physical activity, vision, dental, case management, communications. You, you still need all those things. But that's not the wellness program here. That's the tools that lead you to the goal. You can call that wellness program if you want, then I'm going to find something else to call the self-leadership. All right, positive actions. It's the fourth pillar, reinforce the culture of health. You've got to reinforce the positive things, champions. You re every touch point needs to be rewarded. You have a, here's the best thing, here's the worst thing, however you define best and worst. Make people know when they choose something, they're choosing the best thing or the worst thing. they got to know if they're choosing the worst thing. And what happens is, after a while, people say, well, maybe I ought to try the best thing. And then they migrate over it by themselves. But that's through that self-leadership training as well. What's rewarded is what's sustained. Here's some positive ways to reinforce. I think you, you need to get away from cash as fast as possible. I think you companies have cash 
to get participation, but I don't think you have enough cash to get engagement. I don't think any company has enough money to get the engagement. Where you really have people doing health risk appraisals, perhaps, biometrics, perhaps, everyone needs coaching. And then I would say they need four other programs, uh, four other programs, and, and they've got to go through those modules I talked about. But the four or two of them could be in a company. But I think the company should be engaged in the community, so one of the programs has to be in the, in, in the community whether it's in a faith group or a, a service organization or whatever, the schools. And the fourth one has to be in the family. What is it that you're doing in the family to talk about the health of the family, health of the children? We just published the article with IBM as their, their idea. We just, we just did the data analysis and helped them publish it. Is that what can you do in the family? So one person, example we used, they went into their family, talked about the value of health, that alone is that alone is a wonderful outcome. But then they said, I, I got an agreement with my 12-year-old daughter to walk 20 minutes two or three times a week for six months. And they did it. Now, something nice is going to happen in those three 20-minute sessions a week, or two 20-minute, whatever it is. And so a lot of positive things that come out, not just the exercise, but it's the concept of building. Now, the company is building engagement with the community. The company is building engagement with the family. So you can go from that. Those are just two examples of what you can do. Quality assurance is the last pillar, and they're all important. Here we've got outcomes drive. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You can't direct it. You can't improve it. You can't understand what's going on. So you have to measure all these things. Everything has to be measured. Now, here's where we, we go to the CEO and say, tell me three metrics that you want to find every day, every month, because we know that you get three metrics for quality. We know that you get three metrics for safety. And let's give you three metrics for healthy and high-performing people. So get that to the same level as safety and, and quality. Then the HR person, human resources, what do they want to know? What do all the managers, any of the managers want to know? And then we have to have a system that will feed those metrics to them. They call them a dashboard, some people call that. Now, the senior leaders, here's some things that the senior leaders might get to. Uh, what's the effectiveness of senior leaders? You might say that if I would like to see every senior leader have part of their performance evaluation, what are you doing for healthy people? So you can get some, with the senior leader engagement index, create the only engagement index for them. Operations leadership, have an engagement index for them. And how good are your policies and culture and environment? Are they in alignment? What are the metrics to measure that? Each company is going to be a little different. Self-leadership, are you making progress towards self-leadership action? healthy workforce. Because you got the workplace and operational leadership, the workforce and the self leaders. Recognition, are you recognize are you recognizing the right things? And I'd like to see people get away from individual recognition to, to population recognition. What what's your department doing? Is your department a good pop, population? Do you have you have healthy and high performing activities in there? Do you support each other? And recognize healthy and high performing departments you know, subgroups of uh, population. And in quality, are you measuring all the right things? Are you bending the trend? Are you bending the cost term? Are you on the way to be a best company to work for? I think that's equally important as the zero trends. You got zero trends and a best company to work for. That's our goal as a most private company we started. Now, here's a summary. And there's three minutes, four minutes in summary. Do nothing strategy. Do you want to be do nothing strategy? Well, just do nothing. That's pretty easy. And then that means that you have to sell more product, get more efficient, ship more costs to employees, ship, ship jobs to Mexico or China, and then you do nothing and you don't get by. Or you can be a traditional company. Your leader sometimes knows it, sometimes they don't even know it. And you bring in some lunch and learns, you bring in some people do screening and so forth, and you're just happy. You, you check mark, you've got a wellness program. Or you can be a comprehensive company. Your leader it may give a speech, and you look at risk reduction, almost all risk reduction. You reward achievement if they lose so many weights in. So much weight, you give them something. You know, then you give them money. And the employers have learned, oh, I'm going to wait around. For, what are you going to pay us for next year to do? You know? and, or you can be a champion company. And that's what we, we're looking, we're looking for companies who want to be champion companies. So the vision, they have the system, they have the systemic Everyone's a self-leader. They recognize positive actions, and they measure and report back progress in all areas. 
Now, to do this, to go from best practices, you know, best practices are a waste of time, in my opinion. You know, those are something that people have been doing for the last four or five years, ten years. Why do you want to do something that people have been doing for a long time? You know, if you're a hockey player, you know, you know the great one says that you don't go where the puck was, you don't go where the puck is, but you go where? You go to where the puck will be. So what are the next practices? And, but to get that, what I just told you about the five pillars, I think you'll need some new tools. One, you're going to need a new generation of health risk assessments. And I blame myself uh, a lot for that because I think we've done six million, but we got all negative stuff. Just negative stuff. You know, you're overweight. You know, what do you weigh? What are your exercise? All, all risk factors related back to Framingham, 1950s, white males, uh, risk factors towards cardiovascular disease. Pretty much the same thing. A few extra different ones. But we got to start thinking about the things you told me or I mentioned on the first slide. What are, the, what are the overall goals? And we, we started with that two years ago with our, with our analysts here. We, we identified those same things. We sent them all out with two or three words to look at. The goal was, can we measure those? Can you measure optimism, resilience, you know, resil you know, vitality, and so forth? If you can, is that connected to cost? And then can we, can we get it down to two or three questions, or can we put it in the web and just have drop-down menus, all those extra questions? So that's what we're doing. That's going to come out in July. The next generation health was ask people positive things. Put it at the front of the, of the profile, front of what they get back. So they get those things first. Then we still do the, the last, we still do the risk factors. That's still important, isn't it? Now they're going to go away. But we've got to restart thinking some other things because this other stuff is not working. It's just consumables right now. The corporate culture and environment, we have an environmental audit and a cultural uh, perception of the culture. We do the gap analysis between real and ideal. We do gap analysis between managers and employees, and a huge difference there. So those are important tools. And then what do the employees go after work? And and we're starting to realize that now. They just don't, you know, we've put a lot of work on it. We started on employers over 35 years ago. But now they, when they leave here, they go to the community and they go home. So we've developed a community assessment as well. We've rated every zip code in the country on an uh, uh, index of how good that zip code is in terms of a place to live and grow. And then we haven't done much with the home yet, but we're working on, on that one. That's, that's going to be the toughest one. And, uh, we are developing that, redoing our family wellness appraisal, which we did. In, we did 50,000 of them in the, in the mid-90s, and then we, we dropped it. But we're going to come back with that family assessment. So those are new tools I think you need going forward with the next characteristic of a company. Just uh, reiterate systematic, systemic, and sustainable. And that's all. Uh, I'd say that uh, usually I end up with a thing with, with um, what's the point? You know, what's the point of all this? I mean, we're, we've been in this, and, and many of you have been in this for a long time. We've got a lot of good people in this field. We've had a lot of good results, but it's not big enough to improve the in, Impact the population. We have 350 million people in this country. So how are we going to do that? And you know, we can just throw up our hands and retire. I'm not going to do that yet. Another 30 years ago. But what are we going to do? We got all these good people working on these things. All everyone wants to do the right thing. So I think the point, actually, the point in this is how do we help each other? How do we help each other as professionals? How do we help each other keep a healthy and help it stay healthy? How do we help our family stay healthy? How do we help the people we work with stay healthy and high performers? What's the value to the community? What's the value to the home? How do we have our company be a great place to work, the best place to work? How do we help our family be healthy and high performing, our faith groups to be devoted to what we do, our communities to be a good place to live and grow our children? And people on the phone, you are the custodians of our culture and lifestyle right now. And what are we going to do? What are we going to turn over? When we turn over this to, to the next generation, what are you going to turn over? Are you going to use it all up and then turn over nothing to them? And I think we have such a responsibility. I feel so passionate about this that we just have to do a better job, and do what we do, and do as good a job as we can, measure it, and see if we can improve it. But let's, at least let's have people not get worse. Just don't get worse and help them get better one step at a time. And the first step is don't get worse. 
Hi, Kelly. That's as fast as I can talk. <laughs> that was a lot of information in 56 minutes. <laughs> and uh, speaking to that, if you have a quick question, we have a couple minutes left, go ahead and type it in and I'll read it off. And in the meantime, these slides are going to be available for review, so you can go through them at your leisure at healthpromotionlive.com. By Monday, the recording should be out there as well. If you're interested in the CEUs, they're at the same website. And um, I'd like to thank... Dr. Eddington, for speaking with us today. It's a lot of good information. By the way, Kelly, is that going to be in the morning on Monday or afternoon? I want to make sure they know when to we'll go look for it. Um, it. It should be there by the morning. It's just okay. a matter of um, producing the video. Yeah. Okay. It I takes a little that. while. Yeah. So. Yeah, good. And then um, I do have one question before we go. Okay. Um, Linda would like to know how this message has been received by the CEOs of the companies that you've addressed. Well, that's, uh, that's, I was often interested in that. You know, CEOs get it easiest. The CEOs are the easiest sell. They get it right away. There's absolutely no issue because they don't worry about ROI. They worry about the people. What's our people like? And this is so intuitive to them that they say, why, don't, why aren't we doing this? And because everyone else in the organization has deliverables. So everyone else in the organization worry about their deliverables. They're not working, looking at that. So I think uh, what I've challenged some CEOs, and, and only a few have, have it taken it up on it yet, this is a concept that's new to them. So intuitively they get it, but implementing it is another thing. Uh, so we got a lot of uh, companies that are on the journey to a healthy and high-performing uh, uh, company. Uh, no one's there yet. I don't think everyone ever will get there, because as soon as they get close, I'm going to raise the bar again. Um, but uh, they, they get it, and, and if they're enthusiastic about it. Uh, I get a lot of them, and I'm going to say, well, can, we, can, we, can you come to our company and talk to our people? And sure, I will. I'll go any place, anytime. But what I want to do is train others to think about this. We're going to talk a lot about this on our March 9 and 10 uh, wellness work, 30th Annual Wellness Workplace uh, Conference in a couple weeks. Uh, we need to train people to think this way. And a lot of you act this way. Uh, but and then it gets down to the business, you do wellness programs, wellness, weight loss, and so forth. But CEOs got it right away. And that they're, but whether they can implement it, they need to think about how do they implement it. They're very good at you know, implementing new leadership style, new management style. But to implement this, this is a tough one. And Lynn wants to know if the online tools that you mentioned earlier are available at that HRMC website that you have up. Uh, not yet. Uh, there are going to be the the um, perception tool is probably the the one closest. The environmental audit is uh, close. They'll all be able to available by July first, and the the health, health risk appraisal was the latest one. That'll be that'll take us the longest. We're we've been working on it two years, and we're, but July first is when it'll be up and running. The community culture is probably the next longest one. It'll probably be in June sometime. I'm just putting numbers out there, you can hold me to them. And then uh, the perception is probably available in just within weeks, and the environmental audit also within weeks. Okay, and I'll put a link to that website up on our site as well. Good. So, um, well, there are a few more questions, but I'm out of time, and I'll forward these questions to you. Okay. If that's all right. And yep, um, sure. thanks, everyone, for attending. And um, Thank you so much, Steve, for all the information. Oh, yeah. Thank you all, and Kelly and everyone on the phone. All right, and uh, everybody have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.